Good afternoon. Welcome to Esta Portugal YouTube channel. We are here for one more interesting Saturday, one more opportunity to meet our speakers. We speak about the presenters to the ESTA International Conference Porto 2020. is the major event of the European String Teachers Association and every year takes place in a different country of Europe. In the last years, we were in Malta, in Italy, in Russia, in Holland, in Germany, and if we go on, in UK and all, all European countries are able to host an international conference by ESTA. Today, we have two very interesting uh, researchers, I would say, or thinkers about music, players, and the teachers that propose to share their knowledge and their experience about music teaching to the Porto 2020 conference. Is Sophie Till, that is in New York, but he is a member of ESTA UK, so he is a member of ESTA, but she is also a member of ASTA, American String Teachers Association, and AUSTA, Australian String Teachers Association. <laughs> so, a very uh, traveled teacher, a very uh, interesting colleague that I'm sure will fascinate all, all of you. I was already very fascinated with the video because she don't want to speak about playing. She wants to speak about when you don't play. Well, but that keeps your attention, I hope. If you are watching us on YouTube, you know you can write your comments, your questions to our speakers. And you know you, you can uh, see your answers uh, here. Of course, if you want to join our Zoom meeting and you want to be more near us, you need to use your uh, link. If you are a participant of the conference and if you are not, you can immediately re register and we'll have the link and you will be one of us, one of the participants of the Porto 2020 ESTA International Conference. And with us also, we have Cécile Brochet, also a traveler, at least about the ESTA branches, because she is speaking from Belgium, but she's a member of ESTA France. Uh, Cécile is coming here to speak about something that is, I don't know, maybe the most important thing in life. What is rhythm? What is rhythm? I don't know. From the philosophers, I learned that rhythm is something that explains how one thing starts, how it ends and become another one. I don't know if she will agree with this, but I'm sure if she will help a lot to understand what is there and how to feel it, and how to understand it clearly. Is that true, Cecil? Well, <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Well, rhythm is in, in every part of life, of course. I mean, you, we have the season cycles, uh, we have our heartbeat, uh, everything. I mean, the, the body, the way it's structured, yeah, it's, it's, you find but it. Yeah. For example, now we are living a pandemic rhythm. Well, <laughs> what <laughs> I'm sorry to joke, but we need to somehow <laughs> learn how to, to drive into all these problems we are having. Okay, maybe we start with Cecile. Cecile, uh, take your time to present yourself, to speak how, why did you come to this conference, how, why you are with us at ESTA, what you are doing, feel free to say whatever you want to help us to know you better. Um, 
Yeah, as I said in the presentation, I have a kind of a wide, um, wide curriculum since, you know, I went to classical conservatories, like since you made classical study, study but uh, I, from there, I was in a conservatory where it was very open to new music, contemporary music. And then uh, from there, I was connected to improvisation and etc etc and from and from there i went to a jazz school in paris actually um, it was led by a, a violinist didier lockwood so maybe some of you know him and um, so i get to to work in, in in a lot of different fields including doing of my own music so so it's really hard to make a summary of of the whole picture. <laughs> yeah. But what did you start first? The jazz or the classical? classical. I started with Suzuki method. Maybe some of you know that. So I, I, mm -hmm. I started without It's feeling... a motorcycle, motorcycle thing, yeah? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I started when I was four and, and until 10 years old, I didn't read one single note of music, but I was playing a lot. And then I started to read after, you know, after a few years of, of, of playing already. And then I went to jazz later on. I was maybe 25 or something. I mean, after I was graduated from conservatory, classical, concert, uh, classical conservatory. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting, uh, because last week we had David Monti. He was uh, saying that he learn. Uh, he, he likes to learn without to see the sheet music. Yeah. Just like... Well, so. it, it 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 makes sense because I think it's the the the, the whole idea of the method is, is to learn music as a, a, a child uh, learn a language. And it, it, even for us, I mean, we speak before we read or write, so it it, it mm. makes sense. I mean. I think it works very well with very younger kids. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, for sure. There are a lot of uh, research about and experience about that. All we and, know of. But how it comes that uh, how it comes that you go to the jazz school? You went to play violin or a different instrument? Well, I play also the electric violin actually. Mm. So I, but I, I mean, violin is definitely my my instrument. I mean. You know, I play a little bit of piano and other things. I play drums, uh, also some, you know, drums. And, but it's, it's just an aside <laughs> thing. And uh, why I went to jazz, I, I went to jazz because I was improvising a lot. Uh, I, I was improvising for a, a bunch of years. And then I wanted to find ways to... Um, to structure more uh, improvisations. And as you know, jazz, I mean, you, you structure your improvisation regarding to the harmony written. And, and so it's different from just free improvisation. And uh, so it's different, it's different. But I wanted to, yeah, to get some more tools, I guess. And also- And, and is that true? I have a very close friend that is a teacher in the jazz department in our conservatory in Porto. And he is always saying, classical musicians don't know nothing about rhythm. They don't work the rhythm. <laughs> you don't know how to play. You don't, and we say, but jazz, you know, you are like, rah, 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 but you speak to me like this. <laughs> but well, I, of course, I'm joking. But, uh, it's but it's true, I, uh, jazz, for a jazz player, it's very normal to, to practice with a metronome, for example. It's like a daily exercise, no? I mean, you play with, it's, it's a little bit what I was saying in the, in, on, uh, in the video. You play mm -hmm. with drummers most of the time, so you better be precise because when yeah. you play, the, in, you, you, your precision is at the 16 note level. And finally, amazingly, it's not, yeah, I, I had, of course, I had written classes when I was in the jazz school. But I started really getting into the, the world of rhythm <laughs> uh, in Belgium with a guy who was giving, uh, he was giving workshops 
for music teachers. So mainly for 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 um, musicians who were trained classical. And uh, so the I, I would say the first approach, deeper approach to rhythm I had it was with him, and and so it was uh, I was surrounded then with the uh, classical players mainly, and mm -hmm. also I think. It's not a question of type of music you play. Like, I mean, uh, I am amazed how, I think in Russia, for example, the, the way they teach classical music is, is probably very different from the way we teach it, which we teach it in, in, in Belgium, for example, or, or France, or, you know, around here. And uh, I'm amazed to see that, um, I mean, the Russian people I've been working with amazed me most of the time with their strong sense of rhythm. So I guess in their education, there must be something different there. So I don't think it's a matter of, of because there are some jazz players having a bad sense of, uh, uh, of the timing. Yes. So I don't think it matters of the type of music. It depends really of the curriculum and, and the courses and, and you know how, how you've been educated. And trained. Yeah. Well, wh when we we watch your video, it was uh, very clear the the way you show the and the, the examples about uh, how to feel the rhythm. I, I I suggest that everybody goes to see the videos and for the ones that uh, that are new or are listening this for the first time. You know, the Esta Portugal YouTube channel has. Uh, two times a week, new videos from the presenters. So there are a lot now. Uh, so you, there are a lot to see. And those new ones from Sophie and Cecil, really interesting that don't lose it. Go there, see. And if you are not a member of uh, the Esther Portugal channel, subscribe it because we need subscriptions. Uh, also, I, it's time to say because I didn't say in the beginning that it's very important to thanks to Pirastro and Tomastic because they are our sponsors and because of them we can keep alive and keep alive the the spirit of the conference. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I saw I saw in the video the way the way you show us how to make the the 18 dot knot uh, with the 16 note. Uh, I saw also how to make a quarter note triplet but i have a nice question how could you make to explain the swing huh that's a the swing okay, okay. but because it, you are you came from the jazz of course the and swing. so many string players and so many times our students come with the music from inspired in jazz and it's a swing and we say you know play a kind of triplet you have to feel it but like with this clear conceived knowledge maybe you can help us a lot about that well um the, the there are two different things i mean the the the, the main uh um in a larger view you have to adapt to the fact that you will have the 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 major beats are two and four, and not one and three, not one one and three like in the classical music. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Within each beat, yeah, it's a sort of a triplet. But also, you put the accent on the. If I make it slow, and also the, 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 the it's a very circular movement so you so you don't see the rhythm as a linear thing but it, it's really like a, a, a round a, a circular thing and 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 the, the, the thing is yeah it's basically triplets um it's a triplet in english i think yeah so it's dad do dad do dad but of course, uh, if you listen to different drummers, for example, they would, or, or, or any kind of instrument, they, they could, uh, uh, they could put that last, the the, the accented uh, note. They could mm -hmm. uh, put it closer to the to the to the beat or not. Like it could, it could be. Mm -hmm. 
bye, bye. Or, or it could be me. Bang, bang. So you have it a little closer to the to the beat. And it, 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 as I was explaining, I mean, in Baroque music, you could have the same kind of... In Egal, you have the Egal, yeah. In how you want to phrase. But the, the main general, very general thing is, is that and then two and four accented. Yeah. So. I was, uh, well, every time I speak about this with this, my jazz colleagues, they, they, they just say, you need to listen, you need to feel and practice. <laughs> they don't explain more about that. Well, I, but I need to make triplets. No, it's near to triple, but it's not a triple. So I thought maybe you will come to say, you know, we, you, we divide this in 12 and you will make a, one part with seven, another part with five, and it becomes this. So you, you need to. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but thanks God you didn't. You didn't do that. So, but it was a very nice explanation. Thank you, Cecil. Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, I think many people will have a lot of questions for you, especially because you, you, you promise in the video that you have the key to have the rhythmical body yeah so i think everybody wants a rhythmical and exact body so we will keep this for um, for later later uh, just uh, one last um, uh, question is about the research uh, you said you are a researcher are you doing uh, uh, academic uh, research uh, you do or it's uh, your uh, empiric uh, experience no. Uh, it's it's just from uh, having um, having had a lot of different different courses in different mm -hmm. areas and and kind of combining everything and and from also um, I noticed quite a, a bit uh, by just giving master classes or things like that and and seeing on the spot how people react to this and that and etc. So. And, and, and do, do you have uh, do you have uh, things written? Art you spoke about articles, and where can we yeah. find them? Or uh, I it, it, I have two articles uh, written in French, and so I'm now uh, translating it in English. Mm -hmm. So I can whatever. I mean, it, it's open to everyone. It's it's on a website. Uh, it's written.be. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's in French, and I, 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 I know I'm tr translating the, the two texts to, to have it available mm -hmm. more so you, widely. You have a website about that. Your, uh, yeah. I'm very unorganized. Uh, I will have a website where, okay. where it's beyond. <laughs> but <laughs> well, when you will have, or when you want to, if you want to spread your articles, you know, you can always send us and we will send for everybody or we will put in our website also. I, I, I'll bring it with me when I go to Porto. I hope it will okay. happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Cecil. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We need now go from uh, Belgium to New York to meet Sophie, but I don't know if she will speak because she's about silence. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not silent. I just didn't want to interfere. <laughs> there are it's, dogs with children. It, it's interesting because the, she, she's, she has a big, big experience to, to fix injuries in people with silence. You know, silence is a very good medicine. Can you explain about that, Sophie? <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I think what I do and what Ce Cecile is talking about are, are very incredibly related to each other. So... Um, what I'm, my side of that is the, the, the physiology or the physical laws that enable us to do what Cecile is talking about. You know, like rhythm, I would totally agree. If I once ran an experiment on myself and I was thinking, okay, how important, you know, you've got rhythm, pitch and harmony. If you take out, what can you take out? You can take out pitch, right? You can, and still have rhythm you can take out harmony, you can't take rhythm out of the other two. Like mm -hmm. if you just play a long note, it's going to start and stop. So that's rhythm. So you can take pitch out and just make a noise, but that's rhythm. You can take harmony out, 
but that's rhythm. So the one thing you can't say, I mean, it's not that it's everything, it can't be everything, because obviously there's melody and harmony, but it's the big deal. Because well, I think Einstein make the rhythm relative. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's also, you know, it's that exactly what, you know, uh, Cecile was talking about, you know, like, if I want to make magic, you know, it's total control of this, right, of this moment, understanding that that, that rhythm is late, that third note is going to be late, and, but how does the body have tools to do that so it's as natural as it would be if we were talking? You know, the reason we get into trouble as talented players is because we know we want that musically, but we don't understand the laws of how we're doing it. And so we, we try and mirror it, you know, and the arm is up in the air. We're super uncomfortable. And then we shake, we become unstable, we get stage fright. You know, this is like the downward spiral we were talking about earlier. So, so my job is to, is to, um, or one of the things I do is professional players come and they bring, I didn't set out to do any of this work. They would bring different problems. And what I started to realize was one of the most common things were the things that look like nothing at all. As example here, you know, it looks like, it looks like a line of nothing, mm. you know, and these are the most often, these are the most terrifying spots along with um, other things that come up regularly, repeated patterns, tremolo. Uh, somebody came because he had one note, really one note in a recording that was just sort of this, you know, for a very long time. That was his sole job. And he was totally terrified to do it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it's dealing with that. It's training people, it's what I call in line with what Cecile was saying, the rhythm behind the rhythm. That's what I often call it. It's the rhythm of the body at the service of the rhythm of the music. And when we understand how to, to, to marry those two things up, then we can create magic. Um, and, we, and we can feel the magic. Like we, we feel good doing it. You know, often when we're talented, we can do it come hell or high water, right? We'll find a way, but we can pay a high price for that. If, you know, if we go on doing that for 20 years. Um, so that, I think it ties in very nicely with what Cecile was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's really, well, for me, this is really interesting. I, you take out my words. I don't know what to say because I want to keep silence. <laughs> <laughs> So, do you but, want to... uh, in your video, in your video, you spoke something very interesting because you you want to make magic with the silence. Okay, this we know, all of us know. But the, you said we need to be expressive in the silence. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you said a very objective thing that is the silence has a beginning and mm -hmm. an end. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just thinking like a note. One note has a beginning and an end. There's one mm -hmm. attack and the one way of finish. Mm -hmm. So you can make uh, accent, you can make sforzando, you can make diminuendo, crescendo. Is that something like this in the silence? Can we make an accent or a sforzando? Yeah, you can. Let me show you something. Um, it's, you know, it's very easy to draw it, right? If I, can you see this if I draw, if I pull yeah. this down? Mm -hmm. So what, what we often don't understand is that when, if this is my note, right? And this is my fingerboard, um, and this is the point of sound. We enter the pitch here. And if this is like the top of the string here and mm -hmm. fingerboard, and then supposing this is your second note and point of sound here. So there might be a rest in the middle, right? Something in here. The actual leap from this place to this place happens precisely at that moment. Right, it doesn't happen at some vague place in here, mm -hmm. which is what we tend to think. We get even more vague. If we saw a diminuendo and it said al niente, we'd be so vague we wouldn't be able to move. Mm -hmm. But we're looking for this really precise physical moment here that is the leap, the, the speed, and it is fast, that will then send us 
over to here. Now we, we can control that. First, we have to realize that this is fast, but then we realize that we can color that with the bow any way we like. So even though that's super fast, even though your left arm has to go fast, you could give it an accent, you could make it pianissimo, you could make it the end of a diminuendo, right? In other words, you can shade that any way you like, but the physical law of the left hand means that has to go fast. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But then you can control the re-entry. So you have to jump to this place, but you can strike here at any speed you like, which, so you could delay this moment, which gives you that beautiful magic, you know, kind of pause like that, like, oh my gosh, something's gonna happen. Or you could do it fairly quickly, which would make it kind of exciting. So what you're doing is you're, you're taking that physical law of space and you're coloring it with the relationship with the bow and with the relationship with the rhythm. And so you've got endless possibilities, but you can't break these laws. It, you can, but you won't feel very good. Mm -hmm. um, does that make sense? Yes. Well, at least. <laughs> Not a very beautiful diagram. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And a, a very, very uh, practical way of doing um, something without the digital help. This is yeah. also nice. <laughs> I'm not good with the digital. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's really interesting. But if now we have with us uh, Cecile, uh, and if I think together these two things, I, I, I want to ask you, imagine that we have... Uh, For example, 24th Caprice, Paganini. We have a, a silence in between every eight dot note, yeah? So when, when in, because in music, things are fluent and so many times repeatable, while well, some uh, thinkers and the authors, they say music is the art of repetition, So if we will repeat the same rhythm and we need to think about this, how, how do you conceive this idea of uh, expressive uh, silence? We practice a pattern also or how, how is that? So, so I would say two things. First of all, the, there is, the body can't repeat exactly the same way because it jams up. So like if you can run an experiment. If you try and tap your nose exactly in the same spot, your arm goes tight. What we can create, what, well, what rhythm does is it creates difference. So if you sing da 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 every single one of those is different. Mm -hmm. And that difference is the organizing principle for the body. So for example, at, um, let's, let's look at speed and then let's slow it down like in the Paganini. So if I want to play those 16s, so semiquavers, Each one of those, if they're going to go really fast, has to have the right amount of sound and physical relationship, or I'm going to get stuck. So my left hand is actually creating that rhythmic that the bow is articulating so that you've got speed, right? The speed is in that change in personality. So if I play... My left hand is actually doing that. Super, super nano tiny. Rather than just my bow. So the left hand is actually striking that string according to the personality of each one of those notes. Bum, 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 bum. Does that make sense? So there's a, that the rhythm, the expression of the rhythm physically is that organizing principle that gives us technical speed. Mm -hmm. That's what we, the rhythm is the speed. Mm -hmm. and, and when you play, would you think like Cecile in the subdivision? Yeah. Or do you think on the oh, silence? In the Paganini? <laughs> or in, in something very fast or in something slow? Something like the Paganini, for example. No, what I would be thinking is what, what we're bad at, and we also get 
injuries from this too. We're pretty good at starting notes. We're very bad at seeing where they end. So if you think of a notes in a piece like a tennis game, if I hit the ball to you, you hit the ball back to me. But most of the time we just hit the ball as if there's no one the other side, right? right. It's like a one way game. So then if I don't know where the end of the note is, right? This doesn't, the next note is unclear because if I don't end that note, if I don't create the decay perfectly, I can't hit the ball on the next note. So what I'd be listening for is the decay. So the decay in the note tells you when to play the next note. If I misread that, I'm taught like the arm doesn't know when to move, right? So it's creating that tennis game logic from note to note that the body understands where we're like, so see what I'm saying, that is the swing. It's the, we don't think of Paganini as yeah, having and, swing, and, but it's and, swing, right? Yeah, and from, um, sorry to be, a little boring maybe but <laughs> from the 16 notes to the eighth note this da -da, da -da, yeah. is that a ricochet feeling or uh, does it that is still a silence to think or is one one thing it's okay that's a great question mm. so it's one thought but with everything loaded into the one thought so mm -hmm. playing the violin is like playing golf Right, you know, when you see, I don't play golf, but <laughs> when you watch it on TV, you see them do these amazing things. They hit the ball and they've hit it once and the ball goes down the green and then does some amazing right turn, right? Mm -hmm. That like they, the ball yeah. does this amazing, but they injected that trajectory in the moment of strike. So we are the same. So I, I get one golf hit, but I have to be a good golfer. <laughs> so, so the rest, right, is in, it's in my golf strike here, and there are bow techniques that create that, but I get one shot, so it's one thought with a rest in it. Yeah, but, uh, but you, you, you think about the rest between the 16 and the next eight note? Yeah, that's part of the technique, absolutely. There's something called bow shaping in the right yeah. arm that creates that trajectory in the sound that's a whole area of study. and when we speak about legato uh -huh. in different bowls for example mm -hmm. this is also that is also a silence there yeah that you know what that so this is really interesting you can we can run an experiment so you can all do this so there is no such thing as continuous sound okay because really Really, really, there's the my students. I'm always asking. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. There's the illusion of continuous sound. That's different. Ah. And there is the art of the illusion. Yeah, but because you propose to speak about magic. Okay, now yeah. we have the right thing. Go on. <laughs> but if if you do this with your arm, you can feel, you can just kind of rub your hand across your arm. You can feel the turnaround at either end. Yeah. Well, there's that kind of sticky moment there. Mm -hmm. So in the body, in the laws of the body, if you go forwards and then you go backwards, the, the muscles have to neutralize in order to go the other way. So I can't be going to the left and keep my muscles organized to the left and pull my arm to the right. Mm -hmm. that, that's going to create all kinds of tension in the arm. So there's this time we're super fast at it. We're brilliantly designed. There's this moment of neutral at the end. So that moment of neutral means things do stop, but we have tools that make create the illusion of continuity. So we have to obey the stop, but we have to create the illusion of continuity while we obey the stop. Otherwise we would, you know, I mean, it sounds like I do if I play, Right, this is legato, mm -hmm. but I am stopping, literally stopping here and here and here and here. But I'm using tools in my bow arm that smooth those moments out so they're 
microscopic enough to not disturb the music. Mm -hmm. But, but so, by physical so, law, they're there. So you learn legato separately, note by note. You can learn it with the bigger silence. Yeah, you can learn it with the bigger silence. Yeah, this is some yes. exercise that I use sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you have to, you, in other words, you have to train the arm to understand how to stop first. Because if, if you don't let the muscles turn around, then the arm will be tight. And then the neck is tight. And, you know, halfway through a symphony, you're ready to fall off the chair. So all the bow is doing, you know, doing this kind of thing. Cecil, <laughs> so, Cecil, do you want to comment this from your point of view? I'm fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, if you, uh, if would you, you being to explain the legato with the rhythm, how, how you could say it? <laughs> I, I, hmm. I, I would almost say the opposite. I mean, you will uh, subdivide in 16 maybe one two three four one two. <laughs> i no, do this many times i do the, sometimes help me for the legato to feel the, the so. yeah i mean if 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 you want the note being alive inside it's it's a way to do it, it, you know even in shorter things like uh, when you have the vivaldi uh um uh for two violins like opus Three number eight, like you, it starts like and and if you the the two first notes, the quarter notes, if you if you just play quarter notes, it doesn't it has no life inside. But if if you hear so I now inside I hear that little clock. And and then it makes it gives a different life to the, the same note. So I think it makes sense, uh, even in the legato, to to still feel uh, the the movement underneath. I mean the the, the rhythm underneath. Mm -hmm. I don't know. If, yeah. Cecile, do you, one thing I would talk, like in that example, right? Isn't it on those the first two notes? That also that this. One thing that we never talk about, that we have to talk about, because it is that logic, that physical logic, is that the set, one is beat one and has a beat one character, and one is beat two and has a beat two character, of course. Yeah. right? And we never talk about that. We talk about strong and weak, but beat two isn't weak. It's just, it's just not beat one, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know, you could make it legato if you want, but it, there is a law of beat one being that personality and beat two, right? That, yeah, yeah. That is that kind of aliveness that we want mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the sound. So that 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 comes up all the time. The, the understanding the person, like why do composers, especially Beethoven, right? Why does he put something? Why does he put a sports ando on beat two? Right? They most people put it on beat one, but two is totally different sound. So that strike of the note, that rhythm strike of the note and the sound that we should look for should be totally different. Like you were saying two and four. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Yeah. And that's really fun to, to, dis, to discover, right? And to mm -hmm. explore. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is amazing. I should uh, stop uh, make question because uh, these this issues are, uh, a little crazy for me. I'm this kind of freak guy that uh, likes to control everything <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and I want to know, you know, I have a, a whole note, I will divide in 16s, and after I will do crescendo the first three, I keep the sound to the next five. <laughs> but and you know, I improve the speed of the bow. Sometimes I, this is not my way of play, but sometimes I do this kind of experiments home, and I really like that. So but I should I make keep my mouth because maybe I can not be so good for you because maybe I make it crazy too much. But but uh, yeah, go, Cecil? Yeah, I was you... going to say, it's very interesting uh, with the students, actually, 
it's to actually make them play the inner notes uh, because then after when they play the longer notes and they have heard that their their ears had heard the what is inside first of all they may, they, they have more chances to make the the, the right length uh, but also you know it's it's um yeah the, the light that we put in their note is different just from as an exercise just from actually really playing it and it yeah and it's also a way to solve a lot of written problems actually can i add to that you're totally yeah. right one one of the things that comes up in the very very soft playing is that people's brains and bodies go into a void uh, so they do try and they try and do for two things. First of all, there's there's just gap, there's just space, which we can't float around in. Um, and second of all, they try and play flat lines. You know, straight lines don't have momentum. So one of the things that actually we do very quickly, very early on, is to put that sub rhythm in, just just internally on a long note. Exactly what you're saying, so that there is that sort of logical propulsion in time so the the long note is actually being supported by the rhythmic logic that's underneath it and when we don't feel that our brains are just you know th there's like you were saying if the brain isn't organized forget the body right <laughs> the arms will have no idea what to do so that that sub rhythm's huge and mm -hmm. the longer the notes, the more we need it. Mm -hmm. So keep counting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I count of you, because now it's time to open discussion for our participants at the meeting. Uh, someone, uh, feel free to make questions to our guests. Oh, everybody knows everything. Well, I, I still have more questions. <laughs> uh, Sophie, how it comes that you start to think about this? It's a really good question. So I didn't start to do it for other people. That sounds super selfish, but I didn't, I wasn't trying to set out to do what I do now. Um, I, when I was about 16, um, I remember being in a practice room with a mirror playing, trying to play some Paganini and thinking, it doesn't make sense that I have 10 fingers and a good brain, that, that some people can do this and some people can't. It has to be knowledge of physical stuff right, that the, the actual processing of how the body is functioning has to be the difference because I have the same number of fingers, right, and essentially the same things going on. So I think that was the beginning of it. Um, and then when I was about 30, um, playing, playing a lot of concerts, the concerts were increasingly stressful. Like it was not, it had gone from being really a joy to play to just acutely stressful. I didn't have pain but it was like walking a sort of intellectual tightrope. So should something musically go off in a new direction, I didn't have the elasticity in the playing to do that. You know, it was like, I can only execute one way. So I actually couldn't find anyone in the string world with who gave me convincing answers. Um, you know, I'd had wonderful teachers. And then I met this pianist in New York through a friend. And I just, we, we were playing duos and I went for a lesson with him and asked a question and it was bingo. She just solved it in about 30 seconds in a way that made the brain and body fit together. Like, oh, that makes perfect sense. So I went and started taking lessons with her. Uh, so <laughs> I learned all this in piano lessons and I'm a horrible pianist. I can't play the piano. I still can't play the piano. Um, and then because people... Of the pedal. Yeah, because of the pedal. It's only... <laughs> because of the... I don't know, 88 keys, four strings. <laughs> I'll take the four strings. <laughs> so, um, and then people started asking questions. Like people started bringing injuries. Uh, and that's how it has developed since then. 
And then I really realized that, you know, I'd had this wonderful training and because I'd had this wonderful training, I understood how we're all wired up here fr from childhood. And that, that's been a big part of being able to help people and, and kind of get in there and sort things out. Um, and it's just grown from there, but I didn't plan on any of this. Wow, nice. Cecil, and you? How is that, how is that come that you start to, to make workshops of rhythm? <laughs> uh... The, it's it's part of what I do, but I mean, it's it's a yeah, it's just a part of my activity. I mean, you know, I am an improviser, so I give workshop about improvisation as well. So it's you know, but I I really like that um, written tools because as we said before, it's so essential, and I think sometimes it it's so necessary because. Um, probably it has been improved in, in, in the classical conservatories, but I think it's still probably uh, not necessarily the, the, the main, main topic. And, and it should somehow, because it's, it's the ground of, of a, a lot of different things. And uh, in music, but also it, 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 you know, it's about emotional stability, self-confidence, it, 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 you know, it touches a lot of uh, very uh, central abilities and music. <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, and, and you, maybe uh, yeah. you are a teacher. You have students, or, or yeah, no? Yeah. You have regular yeah. students. Yes, I I have a, a, a students. I, I teach violin. I teach improvisation. I teach rhythm. And uh, I teach sometimes electric, electric violin when I have students for that, so. <laughs> oh, interesting. Can I ask Cecile a question? Yeah, of course. So, Cecile, one of the things, I'm curious if you agree that you see the same thing. One of the things that I have noticed doing this is that our, in general, our, as classical players, our understanding of music uh, is sort of frozen at a less um, developed point than it could be, that, that we understand kind of the rudiments of rhythm, but we don't understand the, the expansive nature of expressive rhythm. Oh yeah, certainly. I mean, and yeah, I guess so. I, again, as I said, maybe, I don't know how it's taught in different countries, maybe it's different from one place to another, but from what I uh, myself, I have experienced, I mean, I had a lot of lacks from my education, although I, you know, I, I, I have studied classical quite to a, to a certain level, but uh, I, I discovered a lot of things about written later on when I was already a professional and, and, and uh, I was teaching and I was playing. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's, it's some neat basic needs and probably i don't know how it's taught now in in in, in the you know regular cu curriculum but but it's probably yeah probably necessary to to see how it's done i it, yeah because also usually when 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 the, i see with the students when they they, they get to to feel in their body and express it, then when they take the instrument, it, it's just so easier. Everything goes well. I mean, if, if, if you have, and it, it's, it seems to me a logical way to work things. It's first to, to have it, you know, to, to, to incorporate it, you know, in yourself, and then you express it with a, a you know, some tool in your hand, but, it, it's amazing also with the jazz, um, the jazz instrumentalist, because you find that the, a lot of these guys, I mean, I say guys because, you know, <laughs> but a, a lot of these musicians um, uh, could play quite well a few instruments. And it, and I, I was wondering why, but I think it's because of that, because they, they have the habit of 
of really dealing with with having the music in their head and their body and then the the the, the music instrument musical instrument it it is it's only there to to apply something that's already there inside and 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 maybe i mean it could be classical could be taught the same but i'm not sure it's the way it's done most of the time so we, we look at very fine details and how what to do with that finger, etc., and, and and not always uh, related to the whole picture, mm -hmm. the, the ground. I, uh, yeah. It's, but it's, uh, I, uh, yes, Dolphin, you you are... the the rhythm is the when to do stuff. So if mm -hmm. you don't know the when, <laughs> you're stuck. Mm -hmm. well. <laughs> around we you know we all need a when <laughs> so and after the how and it's okay <laughs> there you go the when and the how but if if you have the how and no when you're still stuck <laughs> but yeah. uh, i know cecil uh, how is the tradition in belgium but the, for example the french tradition is very very hard about the solfege and rhythm solfege and people read the very very difficult things Mm -hmm. This it's, is it's, asking about the rhythm feeling. Is that the same or? Uh, yeah, I mean, when I was uh, when I was doing my studies at the conservatory, the solfege class was really something crazy. We had to be very fluent in the seven keys, and yeah. uh, and we had all these crazy rhythms and stuff. But you know, it's 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 a little bit what I was explaining in the video. You you take the quarter note as the 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 main you know um base and 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 then you you feel in however you know and 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 it doesn't make sense like if if you have a beat and 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 you decide you have a uh however you call it a quintolet or you know and then they go uh the uh, one two three four five one two three and and, and then you you, you put you your difficult rhythms anyhow in between two quarter notes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something you know the way we. Yeah, but that that is a big problem because after you know French composers start to write so difficult. <laughs> when comes a new new music from France, I say, oh, he studied in conservatory, he did all these lessons of solfege. How can I? Do <laughs> Someone's really difficult. But <laughs> tell, they say, I remember some from Dalla Piccola. Crazy, crazy scores. Well, I have a question maybe. for Sophie. Okay, Maurice. Hi, how are you? Hi, hi. Uh, what about the silence before starting a piece? How, yeah. how, how do you think the, do you think the bar, do you think the nothing, only uh, what do you think and uh, how to explain it to the little ones, to the little students? And uh, for example, a minor concert, I mean Bach, uh, these kind of things, what, what to say in, in, in the silent before starting a piece, this uh, terrible silent, maybe. <laughs> that, that is such a great question. So, um, so very often we're told to breathe, but we don't, we aren't wind players. So the, the, the first thing I always say to people is, you know, the, the instruction to breathe is actually a desire for momentum to, to kind of send the passage going. So because we use our arms, we have to create that momentum, that preparatory momentum with the arms. So um, in terms of, let, let's look at something with the bow, right? And let's, let's make it really kind of extreme. Um, for example, if you had to do a very soft up bow beginning, the, the actual preparatory movement in the bow arm would be very fast and very small because the amount of strike that the string needs to, to, to get the sound going is very delicate. So if I was going to start um, something here, I would, here, let me drop this a little bit. My, I'll make it big and then way too big so you can see it. My arm, my right arm would actually be making a preparatory shape like that, that gives momentum 
to the start of the sound. So it would be very fast and very soft. It would be like a click, like a. So it's the, so that's really fast and the notes really slow because I, you know, the way the speed that the body moves at, I can't move with this. I can't take a big breath and then hold my arm in the air and then swoop my arm along because then it's not stably on the string. So that's, that's one issue. So let's take A minor, right? Um, do you want an open string or a either? Doesn't matter, okay. So the, the fastest way to ask the student is to say, we have to come from the opposite direction. The laws of any kind of momentum, if I'm gonna play tennis, uh, golf, if I'm gonna talk to you, I breathe in and then I breathe out. If I'm gonna hit the tennis ball, I go this way to create this way. So the arm, the right arm has to have this kind of movement in it to get this piece to go down and to get the rhythm. So that it's totally in the arm and it's totally organized um, dependent on how fast that first strike has to be. So if the strike is very, very delicate, it's gonna be super small. Just like if you had to tap the tennis ball, right? You wouldn't go, <laughs> you would make a little preparatory movement here. Um, and it has to come from the opposite direction. Does that make some sort of sense? So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a ton I could share with you on this, but it's, it would take me longer to explain. <laughs> yes, please, and, uh, and please don't say, don't say everything we should keep secret because all the important things will be at, on the conference. So if you want to know more about that very special issue, don't, <laughs> don't take your time. Just register to the conference. <laughs> Can it be what, good what can we expect? One, what can we expect from you at the conference to speak about all these kind of things? From, from me or from Cecil? Uh, from you, and after I will ask Cecil. Um, so, I I would tie all this together so it looks like a comprehensive toolbox of solutions to the most common problems that we see. Right, you know, we've sort of flown around different things in our discussion, but I think it's really important in a presentation that it's um, consecutive and logical, you know, A to B to C to D, and that people have tools that they can take away and use either on themselves uh, or on students uh, of any age, um, but that it's a very concrete set of solutions to these problems that we face. So, you know, it's, it's a takeaway toolbox well thank you very much sophie are you all uh, making a research uh, academic research or are you a teacher on university or so i teach at a university um mm -hmm. i'm a bit more practical <laughs> than research so the research is all really working with people mm -hmm. um, i have a sabbatical next year so that i can make a whole series three more film series mm -hmm. so there's a basic series on my website but we're mm -hmm. going to make a series for orchestral musicians so you, so you want to say yes the website yes yeah, just my name sophietill.com okay so Great. everybody go there fast <laughs> click um, so there will be a lot more material i mean i think it's interesting you know i think there's this division between research and players i'm a player um, I don't think we should have that division. It, you know, it's it's about everything that comes out here. Yeah, you know, you know, you know the theme of our conference is bridges between research and practice. Exactly. So, and I, I think, you know, each of us is perhaps not as open as we could be to the other group, but we we need, for example, in injuries, we need the research because it's very helpful to help institutions know how to help players, right? And, yeah. and for money and for grants and things like that. Um, and is there, is there somewhere where uh, your knowledge is uh, written? 
you have uh, written documents or books or not yet <laughs> well if you want uh, if you want you know we, we will make the book of the conference okay so it will be a paper book so okay. everyone is uh, invited to write uh, their presentation and uh, we will publish publish it great cecil do you want to tell uh, the listeners and the watchers on our youtube channel what uh, they can expect from you at the conference at your yeah. workshop it's, it would be very similar to what sophie said which is well i was thinking... you can make it together we say <laughs> one <laughs> it's funny mm. um so um i i i have really so the, it's it's a workshop because i think it's something to experience uh uh into action uh even though i was thinking of just giving a few words of introduction about, you know, but I, I already gave a, a few uh, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in the video. So a workshop and, and, and giving some tools from uh, with logical steps to solve main written problems and, and how to apply it with the, with the instrument, with the bow, uh, mainly the bow, and, and, and then really very practical tools uh, to use with the students, so that's the idea. Yeah, from simpler oh, written to more complex, and 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 if you understand the logic, then from there you can you know you can apply it to many different cases. Yeah. Well, I think everybody noticed that we have two big reasons to keep together and to go to the conference. Uh, I have to say personally that. It's lovely, and I really enjoy to see passionate people showing what they really understand and they believe. And uh, this has been one of the most grateful things for doing this uh, Saturday meeting series. And I, I think every one of us become more rich and uh, with with more ideas, more inspiration, and we can be more free to be creative and to invent our solutions. That is the most important tool to drive through our, this time life, I would say. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. Thank you for all the watchers on the YouTube. You know, if you have uh, comments, if you have questions, you can always write there uh, in our YouTube channel. You can also write on the Facebook of Esta Portugal or Instagram Esta Portugal. And uh, we will keep all the with the very, very attention and we will answer and we will spread all your ideas. If you want to subscribe or to register to the conference, you are still in time to join the, this fantastic group and uh, thanks very 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 big thanks to Sophie and to Cecile for being with us today and to share so passionate knowledge and uh, very very special thanks for all the group organizing of uh, ESTA Portugal uh, a lot of them are not here I'm I am alone with Mariana and we keep it because our friends and our colleagues are playing in the orchestra now, they have a concert, uh, so they cannot be with us, but they will watch the video and they will be surprised with such a nice meeting we had today. Thank you very much. See you next week. Thanks very much to Thank our you. sponsor, Tomastic. And Thank you. Astro, they keep with us. Bye-bye. See you next week. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you.